Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, thank you. Um, this, this talk is uh, to review our, our submission to ICML, the, the most recent work that I've been doing, uh, which is to try to, to solve the problem of causal inference from the machine learning point of view. So, to start with, uh, well, this is joint work with uh, Craig Amol, uh, Bernard, and, and Ilya from the Max Planck Institute uh, for Intelligent Systems in Germany. And uh, the, the problem with causality is that it is a concept that is even difficult to, to define to start with. So maybe I can use the audience and do a check if, if you can tell me from these two random variables whether x causes y or y causes x. And by causing, I mean that if I intervene in the cause, the effect will change. But if I intervene in the effect, the, the cause will remain the same, right? So you have two random variables. You have the dependence pattern of their joint distribution in this scatter plot. Can you tell me, hands up, if you think X causes Y, one, okay, half of the room. So hands up, Y causes X. Okay, so it seems like the inference of the room is X causes Y, and this is indeed the case. X is the elevation of some German cities, and Y is the temperature recorded at some point in these cities. So if you intervene in the elevation, uh, the temperature will drop, right? But if you intervene in the temperature of your room, for example, turning the heating on, well, your room will not elevate in, in, in the space, right? At least in most cases. So, second one, uh, does X cause Y? Hands up. Y causes X. Okay, so Y causes X is more popular choice, maybe because you thought I should put one in each direction. But here the answer is none. Uh, here X <laughs> is the number of ice creams sold in the US and Y is the number of murders committed. Okay? But uh, still in the scatter plot you can see some, some, some dependence patterns. So what is the difference with respect to the previous example, right? Here if you, if you play God and you make humanity to consume more ice cream, you do not expect people to kill each other more or less. And if you intervene on the number of people getting killed, you don't expect people to start consuming more ice cream. So the dependence here is being generated by some common cause. And this is the, the weather. It seems like when the weather is nicer, people tend to eat more ice creams, get together more in the streets, uh, things uh, get complicated and they kill each other more. <laughs> and and in, in, in the first case, what we had here is a direct cause-effect relationship, okay? So elevation is directly influencing temperature in the interventional sense that if I intervene, if I intervene in, the, in the altitude of the measurement, the, the temperature will be affected. But in the second case, this common cause is responsible for creating this dependency. And the, the question here is now, can we just from observational data, from these scatter plots, infer if um, we are dealing with this kind of situation or the other one? And the answer is no. In, in, in the most general sense, this, this task is impossible. But as humans, we keep doing it. So why not try, and, why not try to do it from the machine learning, machine learning point of view, right? So just to give you uh, another example of when correlation, the symmetric concept of dependence, is not really capturing the essence of the asymmetric concept of causation, here you have uh, an old screenshot from Amazon. So here you are buying this bag. And well, Amazon will tell you better together or goes well with it. You know, since you're buying the bag, why shouldn't you buy this laptop? <laughs> it, it goes well with it. And you, you know, this feels wrong, but it makes sense that if you're buying the laptop, you should be recommended the bag. Maybe that's more sensible. So Amazon has improved uh, ever since. And uh, nowadays, if you are to buy this uh, glass room to shine Schneider, which is a circular glass cutter, uh, you are recommended some other items <laughs> like, um, like a balaclava or um, a backpack with uh, self-deploying wings of Batman. So uh, th there is some asymmetric um, semantics underlying every correlation. And my message here is that every machine learning algorithm is based on correlations or dependencies. So if we make an effort to, to go in the, in the direction of using cause-effect relationships instead of dependencies, maybe we can fundamentally and transversally improve uh, machine learning algorithms. 
Okay, so in a nutshell, we are given some sample from the joint distribution of some variables, in this case, A, B, C, D, E, F. And we are interested in going from this to this, which is the causal structure underlying the, the random variables, the cause-effect relationships. Okay, and just a, a historical remark, there's very two, uh, there's very important players in, in this story. Uh, the, the first one is David Hume, a Scottish uh, philosopher from the 18th century. He was the first one of saying, you know, you cannot observe causation, you can just observe dependence patterns. And as humans, uh, by this um, repeated uh, observation of, of dependence patterns, you can infer causation, but it is not possible to do it directly. And then uh, maybe, maybe David Hume was the first philosopher to take uh, causation as, as, as a philosophical issue and study it in, in depth. And then, at the other spectrum, one of the most contemporary persons to, to study uh, causality in, in statistics is Judea Perl, who was awarded the, the Turing Award in 2011. And he was um, the, the main uh, proposer of graphical models and, uh, and, and base nets, which is the, this graph that I, that I show you here, and which will be the main mathematical tool that we will use. Okay? So, what is the state of the art to recover causal structures from observational data? So one of the most widely used algorithms is the PC algorithm. It was proposed by Spartz and colleagues back in 2000, and it works more or less as follows. You have a set of D random variables, and if you are interested in determining whether there's a cause-effect relationship between a variable i and j, x i and x j, then you will look for every possible subset of the other, ran of the other random variables in the set, and if you cannot find any set such that when you condition on this set, these random variables become independent, then there must be something else responsible for this dependence. And we conclude that this is a cause-effect relationship, right? So if you condition on every possible subset of, of this uh, set of random variables, and still these two variables are dependent, then you conclude that there's a cause-effect relationship. And this looks like a very uh, good thing to do, but there's a lot of assumptions kicking in. Like, you have to make a very strict assumptions between the, the de-separation uh, properties of the graph and the joint probability distribution. Uh, you have to assume that everything uh, that is um, to be observed is observed, so there's no latent variables uh, um, playing any role. And then, even though you consider all these assumptions, in, in, in some cases like this one, for example, uh, you cannot recover the true, the true graph. You can only recover the Markov equivalence class of, of the cause-effect uh, uh, structure underlying these random variables. And since you are um, exploiting conditional dependencies, then this algorithm cannot work in the two-variable case, right? If you only have two variables, you have no third variable to condition on to make your causal inference in, in this way. So this, these methods do not work for the two-variable case. So for the two-variable case, we have another set of um, algorithms. For example, uh, this is called information geometrical causal inference method, and it will look um, to extract cause-effect relationships between random variables connected by uh, deterministic and invertible relationships. And the way that it works is to assume that the cause is generated independently from the mechanism mapping it to the effect, right? So if the cause, in this case, has an uniform distribution and the effect uh, which is this function, is generated independently, it is unlikely to find the correlations between the slope of this function and the density of the input. So if you look at the effect here, which is y, then regions of low slope get translated into regions of high density because a lot of mass from the cost is being mapped to the same point. Okay, so this asymmetry is one of the many footprints that you can use to perform causal inference. A second one is the additive noise model. Here you, um, you allow your data to be noisy, and what you're gonna do is two things. First, you're gonna fit a function to your model, to your data, and then you're gonna look for the direction under which your noise becomes independent from the input, okay? Let's say the variance of the noise. So here, x is causing y again, and you can see that the variance of the noise from x to y is more or less constant uh, across every possible x. But if you turn your head 90 degrees, you can see that the variance of the noise in the opposite direction varies a lot, okay? So under some technical assumptions, you can uh, conclude that the, the correct causal direc direction is the one that allows you to have this independence between cause and, and, um, and the residuals of your nonlinear fit. 
Okay, so this is more or less the flavor of the state of the art. So as, as you can see, the problem with this method is that each of them has a very particular set of assumptions on your data, and these assumptions are very really often difficult to, to, to check in practice. So it, it seems to me that there's a lack for a general cause effect inference procedure that will adapt to the data that you have to analyze without making these strong assumptions or being so tailored uh, to, to the assumptions that you need. So a first step towards the resolution of this problem was uh, given by a Kaggle competition. And uh, here the, um, the setup of the problem changed. Here you are given a lot of data, which is this set. And each of the elements in your data is going to be a sample from two random variables, cause effect, and a label. And, a la and the label will tell you whether x causes y or y causes x. So this is a fundamental change uh, on the problem definition. You're, you're, going, you're, you're phrasing cause effect inference as a classification problem, right? Because you are given many, many, many scatter plots. So each of these SI is a scatter plot, as I showed you before. And then LI is just a label saying x causes y or y causes x. So now the pipeline would be first to extract a set of features from each scatter plot, and then build a classifier on top of these features to classify the direction of new scatter plots. Okay? So the participants usually crafted a set of features by hand, let's say the entropy of x. Uh, so each SI is defined on xi and yi, two random variables. So for example, crafting the entropy of x, the entropy of y, conditional entropies, mutual information, higher order moments, and so on. And then once you have this handcrafted vector of real features, then you can just build a classifier that predicts the label of new scatter plots. And this completely beat the state of the art and, um, and worked very well. But the thing is that if you want to analyze this pipeline, it's very difficult because you are crafting the, the features by hand and then uh, how, how can you tell what this converges to, right, as, as you get more and more data? So this project that I'm presenting here is just um, an adaptation of this scheme in such a way that we can analyze it. We can derive convergence rates and consistency and then do some experiments to, to, to prove these results. So this is the general picture here. Um, we will assume the existence of some distribution here that we call the mother distribution. And this is a distribution on distributions. Okay? This distribution will give you pairs of uh, scatter plots and labels. And these uh, scatter plots are defined on two random variables which are related by the causal relationship that the, that the label L is, is indicating. Okay? So the mother distribution will sample densities on two random variables connected by the causal relationship uh, defined by the label. And then from these densities, we will sample some finite samples, okay? So there's a two sample uh, stage here. First, you sample measures, and from these measures, you sample samples, okay? And this is the data that you get to observe. And now the question is, how can I featureize these scatter plots in such a way that I can derive my consistency and, and, and learn, learning rates, right? So we're gonna use this mu k, which I'm gonna define in the next slide, on, on the empirical distribution uh, defined by by the, by the samples SI to SN, okay? So in the end of the day, this set is gonna be the data that I'm gonna fit to my classifier, which is pairs of features from the scatter plots and the binary labels. Okay, what are these features that I'm talking about? This, these features will be kernel mean embeddings. Um, so kernels are used throughout machine learning to map points into a high dimensional space. And in, in this high dimensional space, you assume that you can use linear models because uh, all the nonlinear dependencies have, have been undone in this high dimensional space. So this is kind of the same thing, but instead of mapping points to a Hilbert space, I will map distributions to a Hilbert space. How do you do that? Uh, how do you map a distribution P to a Hilbert space? Well, you just take the average of your feature map of the, of the kernel that you choose. Let's say, for example, the Gaussian kernel. It's the one that we will use anyway. And then uh, you just integrate the feature map of the Gaussian kernel over the measure, okay? As I said, um, it is not realistic to, to assume that we can observe measures. It is more realistic to assume that we can observe the scatter plots that I showed you before. So then this integral becomes uh, just a sum of the empirical measure of the scatter plot, okay? So I just take my points, I compute the feature map of each of the points in the scatter plot with the kernel, I take the average, and then that's my feature map. Okay, so for the Gaussian kernel, this is actually an infinite dimensional feature map. 
Okay, so this is um, the, uh, an illustration of what's going on. You have two probability distributions here in your original space. These are two uh, scatter plots, let's say, and you map them uniquely uh, to a Hilbert space associated with some kernel K. Okay, and this is the, the feature map for the distribution one and the feature map for the distribution two. And if your kernel is characteristic, this mapping is injective, so you don't lose any information. Okay, this is the ideal case in which we get to observe the measures. But in reality, we observe a scatter, pl a scatter plots, that it's uh, finite samples. So the picture looks a bit more like this. You, you get the sample from uh, the, the random variables x1, y1, and you get another scatter plot from x2, y2, and you can map this again uniquely to a Hilbert space, right? And now the mean embedding will have some variance, and this variance is going to be intrinsic to the, to the sampling. Of, of your method. If you get one sample from one distribution and you get a second sample from the same distribution, well, due to the finite sample size, you, you will have some variance. And we want to take account for this variance in, in, our, in, our, in our theory. I'm going to sp skip this, but in the end of the day, uh, we want to measure uh, how quickly you approach the best classifier in your class as you observe more measures. <coughs> And as you observe more samples from these measures, okay, there's these two levels again. So n is the number of measures that you observe. So this is uh, quite a standard result from learning theory. And then this ni is the novel part of the bound, which tells you as you get to observe more and more points for each of the scatter plots, then uh, your bound gets tighter and you approach the best classifier in your class. Okay, so if you observe infinitely many measures, and for each of the measures you observe infinitely many points, then you, you get your, uh, your consistency in, in the learning problem. Okay, a bit of experiments. Um, this experiment is um, linear models, so each of the, of the scatter plots will be a linear relationship between two variables, and this linear relationship will be polluted with Gaussian noise. So you can prove that this is an impossible problem to solve. You can fit the, the, the same model in one causal direction or the another. So in this sense, we get 49% accuracy. And I put a smiley face because this is actually what you are supposed to get. Okay? If you make it nonlinear, so now the causal relationship is as the one as I showed you before, then the accuracy goes up to 97%. The model becomes identifiable in this sense. Okay? So this is all synthetic data for training and testing. What about if I use a generative model for uh, a synth synthetic generative model for training and some real data, what do we get? So we have this uh, tubing and uh, cause effect pairs. This is 82 uh, scatter plots of uh, real uh, data uh, collected by hand with known causal relationship. And, and you, you get the state of the art in, the, in, the, in this data set. And much faster. In, in practice, we're using a random forest to classify the embeddings. So you don't have to do any independence testing. You don't have to fit any, any, any complicated model. You just push the, the, um, the embedding through the forest, and, and you get your, your label or causal direction. Okay? Another problem is to distinguish the, the ice cream and the uh, and elevation temperature case. And uh, we get good results as well. Another case would be to, um, to test independence, which is to test these guys versus the situation where there is no link between the variables. This would be a dependence test, trained on data for data, and, and you, you also get a, a, a significant result about chance. Okay. Um, this is a rather philosophical problem. I give you a time series, but I don't tell you if the time series is on the correct time direction, or I give it to you reverse time. So here you want to classify whether xt causes xt plus 1, Right, in the time series, or whether xt plus 1 causes xt. And this is inferring the direction of time in the, in the time series. So if I give you these two time series, I don't know about you, but it, it is pretty difficult to me which one is the correct one. But the method uh, can achieve 82% uh, classification accuracy in real world time series. And I'm, I'm going to skip how uh, I do this for DAX, because I'm, I'm running out of time. But up to now, I just, I just did uh, cost-effect cost inference between pairs of random variables. You can extend this to do it uh, on many variables. And we did this in two data sets. This is a data set on, on cars. And for example, uh, the variables that, um, that are in the data set are horsepower, the weight of the car, the acceleration, 
the year in which the car was released, the, the number of cylinders and the engine displacement. And then the target variable usually in this data set is, is the consumption, the, the miles per gallon of the car. And well, you, you, you need a human component to interpret the, the result, but it kind of makes sense that the horsepower is causing the consumption to go up as the number of cylinders. The age is also a negative influence on the consumption because cars get uh, more efficient and, and so on. The car gets more acceleration as it gets newer. The weight is also a cause of the horsepower and so on. So well, it's a bit hand wavy, but uh, th this is another data set. Avalons are some creatures living on the sea. This is also from the UCI data set. And then you have the mid weight, the gut weight, and the shell weight. And you can see that these, two, these three weights contribute to the total weight of, of the thing. The age of the thing will uh, cause the weight, the length, the diameter, and the height to, to evolve, and so on. So it seems like the method, at least these preliminary results on DAX, is able to extract um, uh, the relevant cost-effect uh, relationships. OK, I will conclude here. Um, my conclusion is that causality is somewhat learnable from experience, as David Hume uh, proposed a couple of centuries ago. But there's a still a lot to do, right? Uh, the DAC experiments that I showed you are very preliminary. Uh, and uh, we still need better routines to learn the mother distribution and the kernel functions used to, to extract these features. And maybe as, as related feature work, uh, you can use this kind of uh, distributional classification learning theory to learn maybe the number of components in a mixture, maybe the dependency statistic, maybe some kernel hyperparameters, regularizers, things that you can learn directly from data but do not necessarily have a closed form solution. Okay, that's it. Thanks. We have time for one quick question, maybe. Could you go back a few slides to 24? Uh, you mentioned a competition there and you didn't win the challenge. Yeah, so. Uh, the competition, yeah, the competition had a data set, right? And this data set was built by someone. And we believe that they, there might be some biases on this data set. So if you're handcrafting the features during weeks to, 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 to push up your validation score, it makes sense that you will have uh, captured these biases on the data set. And we are using a completely automatic model, just a kernel in embedding with a Gaussian kernel and, and drop it there. So um, probably that's the reason, I don't know.